Thank you. I'd like to thank all the organizers for having me here. It kind of beats New York. Weather's not bad. The Yankees are not doing well, but um, I'm here. And soccer is much better here, too. Anyway, what I'd like to do is share with you a project that we started back in 2010. Um, and it was a transcultural diabetes nutrition algorithm. It was funded by Abbott. Um, it has legs now. Uh, actually, what's not appearing here is Sanofi has funded a multi-city uh, project in the U.S., which we completed as part of the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists on diabetes care across America, also looking at the development of an algorithm, a diabetes algorithm, for different ethnicities. So the way I want to take you through this is to first define what the problem is and provide you with some clinical context. Uh, then we'll go through some cases and then a validation study, and I uh, should be on time. So to state the problem, it's really how do you optimize type 2 diabetes care for your N of 1 individual patient? And really a corollary to that might be for those researchers out there, when you design protocols and research studies, wouldn't it be great if your intervention was so precise that you wouldn't have to power it as much and they wouldn't be as costly. So this is a way in which you can modulate your research methodology. So we'll talk about precision medicine as a vehicle for this. Also an evidence-based practice. It needs to be affordable, right? Particularly in the US, what determines care, what determines choices uh, is not gonna be what the physician recommends, but what the insurance carrier will pay for. And that's actually one of the problems that confronts us in the US. Also the avail availability of resources and whether an intervention is actually durable or not. When you look at, for instance, various weight loss studies and glycemic control studies, they're going out six months a year, two years. Uh, look ahead, fortunately, we have extension trials, the DPP going out further. If you look at uh, SOS for bariatric surgery, going out 20 years, that's the kind of methodology that ultimately we're looking for. For precision medicine, we're treating the individual. There are population-based strategies. We talk about genes, genomics, the epigenome, uh, environmental factors, and transcultural factors, and that's the component we're going to talk about now. So let me present to you this study, appeared in New England Journal of Medicine, December 2016 by Kira. Valentin Fuster was on the study. What they did was they were able to classify patients um, looking at uh, various uh, uh, exons uh, that could predict uh, the risk for uh, heart disease. And they could classify a patient as high risk, intermediate risk, or low risk. And then what they did also from the registry, whether it's Epic or Allscripts or whatever their electronic health record is, is they could say whether the patient had a healthy or an unhealthy lifestyle. And how many of you have patients who come in and they say, look, you know, everybody in my family died of, a heart, of heart disease, it runs in my family, why should, I, why should I lose weight? Why should I do anything? I'm already destined to be at, at very high risk for heart disease. But here, adopting a healthy lifestyle, uh, within which nutrition is obviously part of it, a healthy eating pattern, but adopting a healthy lifestyle reduced the risk in those high genetic risk individuals by nearly, it was about 48, 49%, by nearly 50%, that was the risk reduction. If we look at risks or key mechanistic drivers uh, for type two diabetes and their complications, adiposity really figures pretty prominently. And what we did at ACE within the last, American Association of Clinical uh, Endocrinologists, within the last few years is we kind of redefined the way that we want to look at obesity. And you've heard various talks today looking at obesity or adiposity or adiposopathy. And really, don't you think we need more precise language? We're talking about interventions to decrease the risk of something, something, whether it's type 2 diabetes, whether it's a complication, whether it's obesity. But we really need to define them. So what we did was we said, look, we recognize the obesity paradox and the metabolically, uh, the metabolically healthy obese patients, uh, that, that BMI-centric definitions are really not helping us much, just like A1C-centric definitions are not helping us much, just like LDL, just like CRP, just like all these other surrogate markers. So what we did was we said, look, this is really adiposity-based 
chronic disease. It's chronic diseases that, we're, that are really our healthcare problem now, not our big monuments of tertiary care medicine uh, and tertiary prevention to treat acute disease, uh, the expensive chemotherapies and cabbages and, and dialysis and, and all of these technologies, but really just the not so sexy preventive medicine for chronic disease. And for obesity, it's the amount of fat, the distribution of fat, and the abnormal adipocyte secretome, and that constitutes adiposity-based chronic disease. Similarly, we have a paper that I'm just uh, finishing, actually right back there, finishing up the last revisions on, di on dysglycemia-based chronic disease. I mean, what is prediabetes? This all started because a lot of organizations were questioning whether prediabetes really serves us well, whether, whether it exists. Uh, if you look at DPP or you look at some of the other primary prevention studies, uh, really these patients weren't at particularly high risk. And if we start screening or aggressive case finding everybody for prediabetes, we're investing a lot of money, maybe for not so much return. But at ACE, we take a different view. We take the view that really we look at this disease as a spectrum. Beginning with insulin resistance, without the hard glycemic markers of prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, but the key mechanistic drivers, insulin resistance, they're all already in play. We want to intervene at the earliest possible stage. That doesn't necessarily mean with drugs. It's structured lifestyles, lifestyle medicine, something we really don't know so much about. We're not taught in medical schools. It's not really part of a lot of the continuing medical education. You look at the rooms on lifestyle medicine at annual meetings, they're pretty empty, right? Everybody's going to where the hardcore molecular targeted therapy lectures are. But here, insulin resistance is stage one. Prediabetes is stage two. Now remember, patients with prediabetes, they're going to leapfrog over type 2 diabetes. They're already at cardiovascular risk with prediabetes. This is all part of the same disease structure. Stage 3 is biochemical disease for type 2 diabetes. And stage 4, you now have the vascular complications, micro and macro, macro vascular complications for fulminant type 2 diabetes. If the intervention is structured lifestyle medicine, really what is that? And we put together a book on that. Uh, my co-editor was Bob Kushner at uh, Northwestern. And this actually demonstrates that in different people, we're, we're going back to precision medicine, who have the same BMI at the top but at different ages. Yeah, you just heard about sarcopenic obesity, right? The BMI can be the same, but with a decrease in the muscle mass, the lean mass, and the same body weight you have this relative excess of adiposity. It's almost a form of adiposity-based chronic disease. In fact, if you look at Asian Indians with sarcopenic obesity, even if their weight is below 22.9, 22.9 or less, technically they're not obese, with an 8% median protein compared to, say, 20 or higher in, in North America, and a culture not represented by progressive resistance training, right? They're, they are descriptively obese. And this was part of uh, uh, V. Mohan Shashank Joshi's uh, Asian Indian diabetes phenotype with the sarcopenic obesity, the inflammation. You can see in different populations, you have different phenotypic presentations of the same disease. So we're aggregating our data in clinical trials. We're using that data for our meta-analysis. Then we're writing guidelines, and we're sitting back thinking that this is going to apply to a target population. We can look at uh, the this, this studies, the DPP trials, and clearly lifestyle medicine is having a good effect, but this is under a protocol. This isn't really free living without instructions, just going a one and done visit to the doctor and, and having a durable effect. So how does the process of transculturalization occur? You start off with consensus clinical practice guidelines written by credentialed and legitimate non-conflicted experts sitting in a room like this but coming together and, and deciding on the way in which they would manage uh, a particular disease state. So in this case it would be diabetes. 
Here's our clinical algorithm from ACE. Uh, Alan Garber is our chair. We uh, revise this every year, so the timestamp on it is one year. Here are some of the core values, the core messages uh, for, the, for the guidelines. Let me just give you one. We don't use sulfonylureas. They don't figure highly because of the risk of hypoglycemia. But how many of you are using sulfonylureas? Right? A lot of times you're using it because it's the only thing out there. Right? It's the only thing the insurance company will pay for. If there's not third-party insurance, it's the only thing available. So we have to be able to adapt to a society where genetic, generic sulfonylureas are really uh, what, what is available. Here's our uh, complication-centric model for overweight obesity. It's not keyed onto BMI. There's BMI here because of FDA uh, regulations for uh, obesity-related medicines and for bariatric surgery, but it's complication-centric. It's based on that clinical presentation. Uh, for instance, a patient comes in with a BMI of 32, but already had an MI, already has stents, has an A1C of 14%, and you're not getting anywhere with it. These are the kind of patients that, you know, in the, in the Diabetes Surgery Summit with Francesco Rubino, they're just going all over these kind of patients that we should start considering a procedural intervention, a bariatric procedural intervention. There's no way they would fulfill criteria just based on a BMI. If we look at prediabetes, it's really early type 2 diabetes. We want to intervene. Now, there are data that 6.0, A1C 6.1, maybe you'll consider metformin instead of lifestyle medicine. There are a lot of other medicines that have better primary prevention data than metformin. But here again is an algorithm that really needs to be tailored to a target population. We can look at dyslipidemia, we can look at hypertension, and these are all the comorbidities that go with it, the various drugs that are implemented. And look at this, the top. You see one green band going across for lifestyle therapy. It's not granular. This has not been fleshed out. We really don't have the data. We've given short shrift to lifestyle medicine in our approach to chronic disease, and that needs to change. It's very cost effective, right? So transcultural adaptation. First step, let's formulate composite evidence-based algorithms. So we take EASD, we take IDF, we take WHO, we take ACE, we take ADA, we take all the various guidelines, pull our experts together, and come up with a consensus guideline that we believe works. We break the silos down. We've all tried that. It's difficult, but it's possible. Then we organize face-to-face -face meetings in the target population of key opinion leaders. We go node by node on the algorithm and transculturalize them for that particular community. And it's doable and it works. I'll show you some data. Then we validate it and we implement it. So what's culture? It's a word that we really don't define so well. It's the clustering of non-physical attributes distinguishing categories of people uh, compared with race, which would be the physical and genetic attributes, the clustering of those. Ethnicity really uh, is subsumed within those, and the others are subsumed within ethnicity. But trans-ethnicity adaptation wasn't the word that worked, so we picked transcultural. Attributes of culture, here are various attributes. You're familiar with them, but each one has a story. And when you travel here in Croatia, you're learning about the history. You're learning and experiencing the food. You're learning about what time people eat, the chronobiology of eating, something that's emerging, that's very, very important. You're learning about the socialization, about companionship, the word companion, friend, with bread, the derivation. Eating is a social event. You go to Madrid, you don't start dinner until midnight. You go other places, you're eating dinner at 6 o'clock. These are the kind of factors that you need to understand, the religious restrictions. The Mediterranean diet, no, it's many different diets, depending on which faith is being practiced. There are belief structures that we as physicians need to understand. There are food policies, food politics, economics, and all of these play a role in the way in which we devise our algorithms for clinical practice and also for your research trials. Here are many factors. Each of these factors are then parsed out and evaluated. And we have the component research, the component biology, to put together this system's effect. 
for transculturalization. Poverty, awful. You look at India and 70% uh, of people, the government says 60, might be a little bit less now, but it's really 70% below the WHO poverty line, which is based on what people, what their, what their purchasing power can be. And look what poverty does to someone, it gives you a sense of fatalism, food insecurity, the need for government aid. All of these things figure into health care and your ability to deliver health care. What are some of the other drivers? This is the mitochondrial haplotype model for diabetes and really other chronic diseases. If you look at the evolution of hominids, of human beings in South Africa, uh, not the Persian Gulf, South Africa, migrating northward, bifurcating at the Persian Gulf, cradle of life, and then going eastward, crossing over the ice bridge, the Bering Strait, and then dipping down in North America, South America, at the Pima Indians, 80% type two diabetes. You have mitochondria that have adapted to the cold weather, adapted to the various epigenomic pressures and factors. And by the way, this epigenomic stuff, this is a lot faster than we thought. When Scott Kelly came back from the space station, this happened when I was in India lecturing on it, when compared to his identical twin, 7% of his genome had changed. Within a week, 4%. That's how fast this is changing. So everybody reconsider thrifty gene, drifty gene, all of these theories trying to explain human adaptation to stressors. We have a lot to learn, particularly as we work through the human epigenome. The global diabetes pandemic, you saw a more recent slide earlier today, but this hits the spot. Uh, Europe nearly not as bad as the escalation in prevalence rates in the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Uh, this was an effort by ACE uh, uh, several years ago, 2014, 2015. We were in uh, San Jose, Costa Rica, brought together nine Latin American countries, and we had a consensus algorithm for four uh, refined endocrine problems. Uh, one of them was type 2 diabetes and glycemic control, and we transculturalized each node. Let me give you an example of one of our core findings. Panama City, Enrique Mendoza was there. In Panama, there is a certain level of care for the poor, and there's a certain level of care for the rich. And it was defended. We can't provide all of that care for the poor. And the, those, those resources are available, so if you can pay for it, then you're entitled to get it. And one of our core conclusions was, there is only one level of excellent care for human beings. And that was actually a discussion point we as physicians, particularly historically, through the millennia, have been the champions for the high road, for what's right and for what's wrong. And part of this process is being an ambassador to that concept. This was our TD. How much more time do I have? I know I'm running over. You can just five, five fingers worth. Okay, um, the tDNA project started in 2010. This was our original committee. John, you were on it, and so was David and, and Ulf and, and lots of others uh, that are here today. Uh, this was our core group. This was our original paper. This was our template, and you can see over to the right the annotations, which are the transculturalizations. Uh, for instance, uh, anthropometrics, BMI and waist circumference, different uh, between Caucasians and Asians, uh, for instance. Uh, here are uh, various international foods and glycemic indices. Uh, David, you'll double check this, make sure that we're right on everything. White rice at 73, uh, barley at 28. But what's interesting is if you take some of the pulses, how many know what pulses are? Right? When I ask this question in the US, I get no hands. I ask it in India, everybody raises their hand. But so pulses are your legumes, your beans, peas, et cetera. There's debate whether nuts and seeds are going to figure into those. Um, not all nuts are nuts, as we know. I'm not talking about humans. And um, so, but when you mix, and we learned this from our, our, the Mexican experience, equal parts of, say, uh, barley or a pulse with rice, the glycemic index of the food isn't the midway point. It's actually a little bit lower, that it's a technique that you can use to lower the GI of that particular dish by really pushing and introducing pulses. And the epidemiologic data looking at pulse-eating societies have lower risks 
for a lot of chronic diseases, not just cancer and cardiovascular disease. Here's a bunch of our papers. You can see the Canadian experience uh, in the middle. Here's the, CD, the CDA uh, pa from your paper, John and, and David. Um, looking in red how they annotated some of the consensus uh, recommendations. And what you, what you have is even in these target populations, there's heterogeneity within that target population. So in the U.S., clearly multi-ethnic, uh, but in Italy, the North versus the South, India, you know, all over the place, everybody's very different, uh, Canada, East versus West. So you really need to keep going and keep parsing out this project. Uh, this is the Asian Indian phenotype. Uh, Shashank Joshi wrote this for our Annals of Global Health Issue, where we surveyed diabetes care around the world, and, and actually uh, we had representation from uh, FIRAM from Macedonia uh, that was part of uh, this journal article. You could see the different types of uh, macronutrient intake uh, depending on region, and actually Shashank categorized the various rice varieties and the GI for the various rices, the amount of protein, and the effects. This is a grid, a matrix, looking at the differences across the world. Uh, you can't go into India and say you need to have 45, 55% carbohydrate, and the diet's just not going to work. You have to come up with ways to supplant it. You have to come up with, with uh, favorable foods. So, for instance, guava is a food that has a low GI in India that they like. I can't go to America, go to Detroit and say, you know, you got to eat more guava. It's just not going to work. But yet we write protocols, research studies, we have textbooks, review papers, consensus studies that are aggregated for all these human beings around the world. There are differences in physical activity, differences in the medications that are available, differences in the medical nutrition therapy among the various countries. Uh, this was our content validation study where physician experts were looking at a toolkit which was designed by Joslyn based on tDNA and uh, they, they validated the content and this was the first of our clinical validation studies by the group in Malaysia looking at using tDNA toolkit with motivational interviewing had the greatest effect on weight loss and A1C reduction. And you can see in the corner at the bottom right that A1C and weight loss also were, were uh, related. And also that in the middle was tDNA with conventional counseling, all compared to the usual uh, case control, which would be without the transcultural toolkit. Let me conclude. Diabetes is a global problem with many dimensions in a cardiometabolic context. Lifestyle medicine in general and nutrition in particular are central to diabetes care. Precision medicine promises to optimize diabetes care and must address these ethno-cultural variables. And the tDNA methodology is available. You can incorporate it. Uh, Cyril and I were discussing that. If you wanted to design a study, make it more precise, there's almost no cost factor to do this. You carve out some time uh, at your conference, you pull together your key opinion leaders, and you go at it with a, cons you do some pre-work, uh, almost like a Delphi uh, uh, protocol, and you do some pre-work, and you go node by node, and you can transculturalize and then incorporate it in your research study or in your clinical practice. Um, but it's an easy tool to incorporate, and right now we're in the clinical validation phase. Thank you.